door underwent a total transformation. Um, he gradually moved from being a colonizationist who argued that the best condition, uh, the best thing that could happen for, for, free, for slaves would be to uh, transport them to Africa. Uh, he thought conditions there would be better than they were in the middle Atlantic states. He thought that um, uh, he made a tremendous argument for uh, the settlement of the city of Liberia. And he thought that Liberia uh, and the capital of Monrovia would eventually become a magnet for the oppressed uh, people and particularly the oppressed blacks of the world, much like America had become a magnet for the oppressed people of England and, and other European countries. And he thought he envisioned a grand migration to uh, Monrovia. And uh, he saw it becoming a flourishing uh, seat of civilization. He wasn't uh, of the thought that he would, if they were just shipping people off, uh, shipping freed slaves off to some uh, you know, into exile, he thought it would develop into quite a flourishing haven for them and that they would be better off. He also thought that the slave owners in the South, uh, many of them wanted to free their slaves, uh, but a lot of the slave laws of the individual states required that if you did free a slave, the slave had to leave the state. and. Uh, the settlement of Monrovia would give uh, those uh, more benevolent slave owners uh, the opportunity that they needed um, uh, to free their slaves. So from 1834, you have him as a colonizationist. Uh, and that was January 1834. Uh, that spring, Dorr goes into uh, the Rhode Island General Assembly and begins getting involved in a number of other projects. And you don't hear much about slavery from him until 1836, when he introduces a resolution to abolish not only slavery, uh, not only slavery, but the slave trade itself in the District of Columbia. Um, and he called it a national evil that slavery was allowed to, to exist and that the slave trade uh, existed and was carried on in the nation's capital. Um, like a lot of Doors resolution, more progressive resolutions, uh, it was defeated um, resoundingly. In February of 1836, the Door gets involved in a very interesting uh, scenario He's still a member of the General Assembly. He's only 30 years old at this time. And he gets involved in a debate in the General Assembly with Benjamin Hazard, who was this wizened, longtime member of the General Assembly and is essentially has been Doerr's nemesis since Doerr became a member of the General Assembly in uh, May of 1834. Hazard. Um, introduced a series of resolutions and a piece of legislation in February 1836 into the Rhode Island General Assembly uh, that would essentially prohibit Rhode Island anti-slavery societies. So uh, now we've moved away from colonization societies and we're talking about actual abolitionists who want to eliminate the, the uh, free the slaves, you know, whatever the consequences are. Um, there were a lot of the anti-slavery societies from around the country were sending mailings, pamphlets, and various publications into the South. And the Southern states and the Southern legislatures saw this as a, an extremely dangerous uh, scenario. Uh, that the northern states and the, the abolitionists were potentially going to foment 
slave insurrections uh, in the southern states. And um, the southern states began to send memorials to state legislatures in the north. And they sent a series of them to the Rhode Island General Assembly um, asking that these, the state legally prohibit Rhode Island abolitionists from sending these mailings into the South. And uh, Dorr immediately rose to oppose Benjamin Hazard on these resolutions. And the, the Hazard uh, introduced three or four resolutions, but the final piece of this package was uh, a law that would criminalize um, any mailing or publication that even hinted at the idea of slave insurrection as a solution to slavery. Uh, the country in 1831 it was still, the South was still reeling from the Nat Turner Rebellion, uh, in which he rose up and about 56 whites were killed. Um, sort of random uprising, uh, and that put the South in a state of paranoia. So Dorr, uh, in response to Hazard's acquiescence to the Southern memorials to the legislature asking them to deal with the, the Northern abolitionists, uh, Dorr immediately rose in response and he used a dual argument. He said, um, at some point, he said, I'm not technically an abolitionist, but he made it very clear that he sympathized with what the abolitionists were attempting to do. Um, he didn't think they would be successful. And this is 1836 now, so he's not quite a colonizationist anymore, nor is he an abolitionist. He didn't think the abolitionists would be successful. In fact, he thought they would probably do more harm than good because with the mailings pouring in and the South in a state of fearful paranoia, uh, the potential existed for slave owners to, uh, more, to treat their slaves more severely, to enact tougher slave codes and slave laws. Uh, and Dorr essentially thought the abolitionist movement would backfire. Um, he thought the abolitionists were well-intentioned and he thought if there were a chance of success, that he would join them heartily. Uh, he called, he, he, but his, his key argument, uh, along with the, the moral evil of slavery, and he thought slavery was a blight. Uh, he used the term blight, not just on slaves themselves, but on the slave owners. He thought that it degraded uh, both classes. Um, but his key argument in opposing Hazard's resolutions on silencing the abolitionists was that it was an infringement of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Um, and that this ran counter to everything that Rhode Island had stood for and been founded on. Uh, Roger Williams came here, uh, he was exiled from Massachusetts with the with founding platform of, of his, his whole philosophy was freedom of expression, freedom of conscience. Uh, so Dorr opposed Hazard, not on the grounds that sla slavery should be abolished, but on the grounds that those resolutions were silencing um, people who had a right to say what their conscience led them to say. Between February and May 1836, Dorr released a public address, a public invitation for Rhode Island abolitionists to come to the Newport State House in June of 1836 and speak uh, before the General Assembly and hear their grievances. And on the very day that uh, they were they were gathered outside, uh, numbers and numbers of abolitionists, the number is clear, but a lot of people gathered to speak 
and voice their concerns about not just the right to address abolition, but just to have their say in front of the General Assembly. Um, Benjamin Hazard uh, basically introduced another resolution and um, some of his allies to get the, uh, the hearing postponed again until October 1836. So while however many people are gathered ready to be heard, uh, they've now been told they were going to be silenced and not get their chance. And Benjamin Hazard said, let them put it in writing and submit it, and we'll put it into the journal of the General Assembly. Dorr, um, I think in a hint, in a foreshadowing of what was to come, uh, tried to outmaneuver Hazard by securing the, the use of the State House the next day uh, so that the people he had invited by a public proclamation could have their time to speak. And he introduced a resolution into the General Assembly asking for the use of the Newport State House for one day possibly a few subsequent days, so that anyone who wanted to be heard could be heard. And unfortunately, again, the General Assembly, led by Benjamin Hazard, the, the old nemesis, um, voted down Dorr's resolution, and the abolitionists were not, did not have their chance to uh, speak against Hazard's resolutions. So that brings us up to uh, October 1836. By 1837, Dorr has lost his seat in the Rhode Island General Assembly. It wasn't related to his position on abolition or freedom of speech. But he's out of the legislature, but he's not out of uh, involvement in, in uh, the public debate over the issue. Um, and at some point, uh, between 1836 and 1837, and it's not clear when or how the transformation occurred, Dorr has essentially become an abolitionist. Um, in 1837, he gets an invitation from James G. Burney, the corresponding secretary of the American Anti-Slavery Society, uh, in asking Dorr if he would be an agent for the American Anti-Slavery Society. And Dorr's reply was that, while I sympathize with the cause completely, and I see uh, the abolition movement as the last uh, hope for our enslaved countrymen, um, I think that my best, my, the best use of my talent is here in Rhode Island working on the suffrage movement. Um, so again, you see the transformation from a colonizationist to someone who thinks abolition um, has no chance and can possibly do more harm than good to someone who thinks it's the last best hope for our enslaved countrymen. And Dorr continues while he says he wants he needs to stay in Rhode Island and work for the suffrage movement and. It, help the disenfranchised, which becomes his ultimate destiny, and why we're here talking about him, um, he becomes intimately involved with uh, essentially the, uh, the giants of the American abolition movement. By December 1838, Dorr has made a complete transformation from colonizationist to full-fledged abolitionist who thinks that it's the last hope for America's and for what he calls his enslaved countrymen. Uh, at that point, December 1838, Dorr's involvement with the anti-slavery movement, uh, at least actively and publicly, subsides as he turns his attention uh, towards running for Congress as a Democrat in 1839. What he would have done as a member of Congress, as an anti-slavery, northern anti-slavery Democrat in Congress in 1839. Uh, we can only speculate on it, but I think it would have been very interesting. And then in 1840, the suffrage movement begins. 
and Doors uh, time is occupied for the next couple of years with that. Uh, and that essentially uh, dominates the, the last nine years of his life, the last 14 years of his life uh, until he dies in 1854. But um, it's interesting that unlike Lincoln, um, right through his presidency uh, into the Civil War, Lincoln is still talking about the colonization movement. He, Lincoln never became uh, what you would consider an abolitionist. He was searching for any solution. Uh, Dora arrived at the solution. And I think the process is interesting. Uh, Fortunately, we don't know what happened. Probably, um, Dorr was open to new ideas. People think he was uh, dogmatic and unchangeable and unyielding, and that's very far from the truth, as, as we see. He, uh, he was open and receptive to new ideas, and he became involved with the people from the American Anti-Slavery Society, and he was obviously convinced that abolition was the way to go, uh, and it eventually uh, eventually paid dividends, but not for another 23 years.